Okay, let's get started. Ghosts are real. That much I know. Hey horror freaks, welcome back to my channel. My name is Amanda. If this is the first time here, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you can get a notification every single time that I post a video and I post every single week. So you can see from the title, today's video is going to be a list of classic horror films that I believe that everyone should watch at least once. Now before I start, this wasn't the plan for today's video. I was supposed to be uploading and telling you guys about my opinion of the latest horror film, The Blackening. But guess what? My local theater decided at the last minute, literally two days ago, to take out the film from being released this week. And for a moment I thought, well, maybe they're going to be releasing it next week or maybe a few days later. No, they're not going to be releasing it. Thank you so much. Because here in Puerto Rico, there's only one company in charge of the local theaters, meaning I don't really have that many options. I don't have any other theater to go. It's either that or nothing. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to wait until the film is available on demand for me to watch it. And if you guys are interested in my opinion, you can let me know. And then I will be doing the video a little bit later. But better late than never, right? But saying that, let's get into the video. Now, before I start, I want to talk a little bit about why I think that it's important to watch classic horror films or classic films in general. As a cinema and film enthusiast, I believe that it's crucial to see these films because at the end of the day, they are what started what we are seeing today. They are the blueprint. They are the beginning. And everything started from somewhere. And yes, cinema has evolved. In general, every single genre has evolved. And we have seen it all. But, but I believe that it's important to see what happened first. What created what? What is the inspiration for these new filmmakers? What made that happen? Because there are many films that inspire other films, filmmakers that they saw this, so they decided to do that. And that's something that we have seen a lot. You see a film and then you're going to recognize certain tropes, themes, um, cinematography. There are many aspects of films that are going to be taken from one and then going to try to be replicated. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And we have seen that a lot, especially on the slasher subgenre in horror. So this is why I believe that it's important to watch these films. You're not obligated to like them. Of course not. You're on your, all your right to like or dislike these films. But I believe that you should give them a chance at least once in your life for you to see how everything started and maybe have a better comprehension of the, at least in horror, of the genre in general. Saying that, I'm going to be starting with the first film that is the 1920s silent German film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. This one tells the story of an insane hypnosis that he uses somnambulism to commit murders. Now, this film features a dark and twisted style with sharp pointed forms, some obliquous and curving line and structures, and also twists and unusual angles and shadows. Now, this film, of course, is considered a classic and it helped to draw attention to this type of art and cinema and it became a huge influence into American cinema especially in horror and also noir films. This is something that when you see this film you're going to recognize every single aspect of it. That's, that's what I said. When you watch these films you're going to be saying hey I have seen this before of course because it starts somewhere and this is it. The second one is the 1922 also German silent film Nosferatu, a symphony of horror. And this one follows Count Orlok, who is a vampire that preys on the wife of his estate agent and brings the plaque to their town. Now, this story may sound familiar and it's because Nosferatu is the first unofficial adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And even with many details of the story being altered, the hair of Stoker at the time, they sue and they wanted all the copies of this film to be destroyed and... Of course, that was unsuccessful since the film was able to be rescued and that's why we're able to see it today. And the film had a remake and we are going to be seeing another remake next year. 
and I am very excited to see it, but yes, this is basically the first time that we're seeing Dracula on the big screen. Now, Nosferatu is also the first film that shows a vampire dying from sun exposure, because previous to this, and some novels like Dracula from Bram Stoker, they talk about vampires being uncomfortable with the sun, but not the fact that they could die if they are exposed to it. So this is also a groundbreaking moment, because... This is a detail that we have seen over and over and to this point it's crucial. A vampire needs to die on the sun or need to have some type of protection in order for that to not happen. Of course Dracula will return quickly to the big screen with the universal classic monsters. Now this is a media franchise that is based in the classic monsters like Frankenstein, Dracula, the Bride of Frankenstein, The Wolfman, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Phantom of the Opera, The Visible Man, and on and on. Now, this is the first cinematic universe ever. So yeah, horror did it first. Now, I wanted to go a little bit general in the Universal Classic Monsters because I couldn't just chose one. In my opinion, I think that they are equally important to be seen. Now, I'm not saying every single film in the universe at least the first ones because there are a lot of sequels but i think that the, at least the first one of each character and each monster should be watched because they are not only great but of course they were very influential in what we have been seeing today in horror the legacy of these characters is unmeasurable these are the type of characters that you don't need to see the original films in order to know them we have seen plenty of modern adaptations we even have some attractions on the universal theme parks and there's rumors that a uh, land that is going to be focused on the Universal Classic Monsters is being built on the latest team park that Universal is making in Orlando. I really hope so because I love this character with all my heart. To a certain extent, these characters are even considered pop culture icons. It was thanks to them that the studios saw that it was possible to make a lot of sequels and gain some money. Cinematic universe were possible and also making adaptations of books, since the majority of the characters are also based on books. But of course, that, that didn't last long, and by the time that we are on the 60s, they weren't that popular, and people were bored and done with the sequels. But before the decade ended, on 1959, we had The House on a Haunted Hill. Of course, this is a ghost story. This American horror film starts the iconic Vincent Price, and it follows an eccentric millionaire and his wife that they have invited five people to the house for a haunted house party. Whoever stayed on the night is what's going to win a prize, but of course, they're going to be making some tricks. This is a film that not only made very popular the haunted houses, something that we have seen a lot in horror, of course, but also helped Vincent Price's career even more. I could do a whole video just about Vincent Price's impact and his legacy in horror, but this man did a lot of horror. He was such a great actor. And of course, this only pushes his career even more, if that was even possible. But this is what made very popular the haunted houses on the late 50s, now going into the 60s. But like I said, this is the decades when we're going to be seeing a shift and we're going to be leaving the monsters behind and we're going to be start seeing psychological horror. And also we're going to be seeing a lot of religious themes and we all know why. But the psychological horror came with the American film Psycho from the 1960s directed by Alfred Hedhodge. This is a film that I could be talking for hours. There's so much to unpack, the production, behind the scenes, everything. Seriously, this is a film that I could be talking for hours. Of course, I will not be doing that. But this is a film that changed cinema, not just the horror genre, but cinema. This is a film that follows Marion Crane, who is running away with the money from her boss. But it stays on the Bates Motel and has to encounter a boy that has a very troubled mind, Norman Bates. Go is considered Alfred Hitchcock's best work and is his most famous film. But this is the one that most people know about. The film was highly praised by the tense atmosphere, the camera work, and also the iconic performances. To this day, we all know the iconic shower scene. This film even had to deal with a lot of the taboos and censorship from the years. 
in case that you don't know this this is something that is so bizarre the toilet scene the direct shot that was a scandal back in the day you cannot show a toilet so directly in a film of course he touch had his ways of messing up a little bit with the rules and getting away with things he even did that with some kissing rules uh the most moment in cinema you cannot kiss for more than a few seconds so he of course made some tricks and that the kissing scene is a little bit longer than it's supposed to but it fits the rule they are kissing for a bit they stop and they continue and even on Psycho, we see at the beginning the intimacy. It's not as what we are used to see right now. And of course, the violence, the way that, that the shower scene is shot, you never really see Marin Crane being stabbed. And they even use chocolate syrup for the fake blood since the film is in black and white. And it works perfectly, being honest. But we never really see her being directly stabbed. Something that, of course, today we have seen it all. But at the time... There was a scandal, but Alfred got the best idea of how to play everything in a way that he could have a reaction from the audience, but without messing the rules of the time. This film is often ranked as one of the best films ever made, and it made a huge impact and a difference when it came to sexuality and violence in films in general. So this was like opening a door for this. It was a before and after. So this is why this film affected not only the horror genre, but cinema in general. And that's why it's praised so much. And also the score. We know the score by heart. Even if you haven't seen this film, you know the score. You know about the shower scene. That's how iconic it is. And I believe that is a sin not watching this film at least once in your life. And also this film is one of the earliest examples of slasher. But of course, we're having other films that they go way deeper into that and they become the blueprint for a slasher. Psycho can be considered the earliest example of some tropes and some things that we see in slashers today. Besides monsters being very popular in cinema today, something that is also very popular are the zombies. And everything happened because of George Romero and his film The Night of the Living Dead. The film follows seven people that they end trapped on a farmhouse while they are being attacked by undead ghouls. But the film is frequently identified as the first zombie film because although they never really use the term, Night of the Living Dead redefined what zombie meant in cinema. This film was also a before and after. Of course, if you see in it, you're going to realize that these zombies or undead ghouls, they are nothing of what we have seen today, but it was revolutionary. George Romero that man, he didn't know how much of an impact he was going to be doing with this film. And of course, like I said, this decade also had something that was religious themes. This is something that also wasn't featured as much in cinema, especially in horror. But Roman Polanski had another plan, and this is why he brings on the 1968 Rosemary Baby. This follows a woman that ends up being pregnant with the Antichrist. This film deals with some themes like paranoia, woman liberation, and cults. And is also considered as the inauguration of cinema obsession with the demon, since of course... Over the years, we have seen a lot of it. We have all these supernatural films. We have possessions and insane popular films that they have to do a lot with demons and exorcisms. The one that opened the door for that. But of course, we could not be talking about this or doing this list without talking about what is considered the best, the greatest, and the scariest horror film in history, the 1973 the Exorcist. This film follows a girl that gets possessed by a demon and this is the first time that we are seeing a possession in cinema. This film was a revolutionary impact that had in people, not just in cinema, is wild. This is another film that I could be talking for hours because of course we all know the story of people going to theaters not knowing what they were going to be watching and leaving the theater in the middle of the film puking we have some press that they were blessing some of the theaters people were scared of course this wasn't something that was usual and a lot of people were really scared about this film and to this day like i said it is considered one of the greatest films ever made and the greatest horror film this has been in debate for years but for many the exorcist is the best horror movie ever 
And when you watch it today, probably you're going to see a lot of flaws. Maybe you don't see that the film is that scary. But you have to put yourself in the perspective of the people of the time. They weren't used to this at all. They had no idea what they were going to. And the special effects, of course, right now, they aren't that great. But at the time, that was as scary as hell. Seeing someone making the twist of the head... Mm -mm. that was something that it was going to give me nightmares back in the day of course today not so much and to bring more into the table this film is the first horror film to ever be nominated to best picture by the academy awards it didn't won the first and the only film until this day that has that award is silent of the lamps but this is the first time that horror is being considered as best picture it had 10 nominations and it won two. So at least horror won something that day. Because of course, we all know that horror is ignored not only on the Academy Awards, but in awards season in general, which I think that is sad because horror brings a lot to the table. It's honestly sad that they don't even take us in consideration. Because of the success of this film, Warner Studios saw the possibility of making a sequel, something that wasn't that common in those times because we saw it with the Universal Classic Monsters, but that stay years ago. They ha they're not doing sequels again. But Warner saw the chance of doing this again, of bringing sequels, because, because with the exception of Bride of Frankenstein, the majority of the sequels that they have been coming out are second properties of the studio. They weren't the type of sequels that we're used to see today. So Warner saw the chance and they took it. So thanks to The Exorcist, we could say, for being so successful that put the idea back of making sequels and this is why we have the amount of sequels and big franchise that we have today. The 17th they were really a year of introduction in cinema mostly in horror because of course in 1974 we have the introduction of the slasher with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre directed by Tob Hooper. This film follows a group of friends that they end up stranded in Texas and they are being killed by a man with a chainsaw that is called a Leatherface. Now this film is the first example of the slasher that we know today. It has many of the tropes that we have seen over and over but also this film was marketed as based on real events. Something that we have seen also a lot but on these times it was made with the purpose of bringing a wider audience and of course it worked this is a strategy that we have seen over and over and i have even seen people that they do believe that the texas chainsaw massacre it did happen but no it did not happen but it definitely made a difference when it came to the slashers of course and also that part of the marketing strategy of horror films and some of those slasher elements that were made popular by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the use of a weapon, the way of killing the victims, the fact that they were teenagers, and also making this a big, bulky type of killer. Like, you needed to make it a certain aspect. Of course, this is something that we have seen a lot. But thanks to Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that we are having so those type of tropes. But the real blueprint and the one that it's considered the complete slasher film it's halloween of 1978 by john carpenter this film follows a man called michael myers that is hunting his hometown Hondonville, illinois on halloween halloween is widely known as being responsible for making very popular slashers in the late 70s and all the way to the 80s we all know that the 80s are the year of the slasher and also is the one that solidifies what we know as a slasher killing of teenagers the masked killer the weapon all of that all of that we know today is thanks to all these films but halloween of 1978 one element that john carpenter introduced that is seeing the film from the killer's perspective this is something that is also used in films like friday the 13th which makes the trick very well since we don't know who is the killer until the very end also john carpenter introduced the use of music with a certain character this is a detail that you will realize is that every single time that michael appears a certain theme song is going to appear friday the 13th is the same these are details that can be considered maybe stupid today but at the time it was perfect and i think that they do really make the difference but the 70s they don't end here seriously the 70s they were a great decade because now we're having science fiction horror 
with Alien by Ridley Scott. Alien follows a crew uh, in the commercial space dog Nostromo that they find themselves against an aggressive and deadly extraterrestrial that has been set loose. By this film having mixed reviews when it first was released, to this day is considered one of the greatest science horror fiction films ever made and has made a lot of influence in how science fiction horror is today and it has been acclaimed by how unique it is and also the realism of the environment. This is something that you can notice and it's the sets and the whole spaceship is amazing since of course CGI wasn't something that was so advanced back in the day they will use a lot of practical effects and real suits and real sets and that really made the difference back in the day and like I said it's considered to they say one of the greatest science fiction horror films ever made. Now jumping into the 80s I have a film that of course we need to talk about that I actually talked about it last week and is The Evil Dead by Sam Raimi. This film follows five students that are staying on a cabin in the woods but they encounter a book that unleashes a demon that they now have to fight because they have nowhere to go. This film was heavily acclaimed by the camera work by Sam Raimi and also the comedy that is presented, something that is widely known about the Evil Dead franchise is the comedy aspect of it. It was also praised by Bruce Campbell's performance as Ash Williams and also the practical effects. Since the film was on a low budget, they did as much as they could, but it was impressive enough. And I think that is the charm of the film, the fact that it's so cheap that is so good. Everything happens for a reason. Of course, I will go way deeper about this film in other previous videos that I have here in my channel in case that you're interested. I did that last I did one last week ranking the franchise, but it's considered one of the most successful cult films in history since the cult following that Evil Dead has is wild. We had Evil Dead Rise just a few months, people were insane going to theaters, it was a massive success and it definitely changed the way that comedy horror is seen today a little bit when it comes to this type of films because of course you can do a whole comedy horror like scary movie but Evil Dead definitely changed how you can introduce comedy in a more serious film and to continue to add to the science fiction horror we have The Thing by John Carpenter and this one has a lot of body horror and aliens. This one follows a group of American researchers that are in Antarctica and they encounter an alien that gets into your body and kind of shapeshift called The Thing. Now when this film first came out it wasn't that well received. It has been praise over the past years and now has a cult following but at the beginning when it first came out it wasn't that well received when i think that the film was pretty good the body horror is exceptional and it really added to the science fiction horror as we know it today also the setting the fact that they are not in space but what could be considered the end of the world no one will get there to save them that's a scary as hell already so adding aliens to the equation i think that is a smart and even more scarier what's heavily criticized is how repulsive it is but i think that that is one of the best parts of the film and of course that's something that we have seen replicated in many films over the years we have seen films way more repulsive but thanks to this one it opened the door for that so thank you so much to John Carpenter once again. The remaining of the 80s, it was full of sequels and mostly slashers. And, but of course, it came to a point where people were done with this. And we can all agree that the majority of the sequels, they aren't a good. So this is when Wes Craven comes into the game and brings in 1996 the slasher film Scream. This is a film that makes fun of the subgenre. But it does it in such a smart way that it turns into a whole new slasher. It is a reinvention of the slasher subgenre. Wes Craven, he contributes to the slasher with A Animal on M Street. He had his part on it and then he did it again on the night is with Scream. And both times it works perfectly. Because on the 90s, we are done with this. We want to see new, th new stuff. So what does he do? He does a slasher that is making fun of the slashers by using every single one of the tropes that we have seen before and it's perfect but also it takes some aspects from films like for example when a stranger's call the opening scene with Drew Barrymore is inspired by the opening scene of when a stranger's call and it works perfectly because the least thing that you're expecting is that the protagonist of the film is going to be killed in the first 15 minutes 
And that was all that we need to know that Scream was going to be one of the best slasher films and one of the best films from the 90s. Scream has been insanely popular ever since and redefines the genre, but also opens the door to films like Scary Movie and those parody type of films. So thanks to Scream and Wes Craven is that we have that type of films today. And this is also how we got some slashers like I Know What You Did Last Summer and You Were Legends, which I think that both are great. We have the return of big franchises like for example Halloween with Halloween 20 years later. Of course, something else became very popular during these times and it's, and it's all thanks to the 1999 found footage horror film The Blair Witch Project. This film follows a group that goes missing into the woods and someone is able to get the footage that they were filming during the days before they got lost and that's what we're going to be seeing into the film. The film was marketed as based on real events. They even put up a website with the missing people but of course it was all fake. This film was inspired by Cannibal Holocaust marketing strategy. They recognize and admit that Cannibal Holocaust was part of the inspiration for making this film but of course we can all agree that the impact that Cannibal Holocaust is way different and that's another whole aspect so that film is not on this list for a reason. <laughs> Well, for many reasons, but The Witch Project is the one that solidifies what is found footage today. Because on the 2000s, we saw a lot of found footage, especially becoming very popular with Paranormal Activity franchise. But this is the one that just like Halloween did with the slasher, is Blair Witch Project. This is the one that makes the base for what's going to be seen into the future. And I think that is pretty good. And while it does recycle the narrative structure of Cannibal Holocaust, it made it even more popular. I blame for the people that didn't saw Cannibal Holocaust back in the day since it was banned in way too many countries. And it has so many controversies around it that I will not blame for anyone who didn't saw it on the time. It's now, of course, available to watch almost anywhere on the internet, but at the time, they didn't have the access to it, so probably a lot of people, they didn't know about the film until now. So I don't really blame Blair Witch for taking the majority of the credit, but, but we can say that Cannibal Holocaust has some influence in the film footage genre, but Blair Witch is the one that takes the, the trophy. <laughs> and with this, I end the video. I have no idea how long this video is going to be. I apologize if it is too long. Now, you could be saying, hey... But there's so many other classics, yes. But if I'm going to be sitting down here talking about every single one, I will be here talking for hours. Now, for the sake of everyone that is interested in more, I have a list on my Leatherbox profile. I will be leaving the link of more classics because I know, yes, we have a lot more classics and influential horror films. But they are way too many for me to sit down here and talk. So if you guys want to know more, I can do a second part of this video. I don't really enjoy doing part twos of videos because I don't I like to cramp everything into one so I don't waste anyone's time but if you guys are really that interested in that I can make another video but I have ended this video thank you so much for watching let me know down below which films have you seen on this list did you know anything about it? there's many of this stuff that I said that is common knowledge at this point of course we can learn something every day so let me know down below which ones have you seen from this list and which ones do you think that everyone should watch at least once on their lives. Even if they don't like them, they should do it. But well, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys on my next video. Bye! That much I know.